Okay, so uh, I'm Jan Horn from Google Project Zero, and I'm presenting slides that were prepared uh, together with uh, Paul Kocha, Daniel Genken, and Yuval Yarom. And I'm speaking on a spectral meltdown, how you can leak uh, data out of speculative execution. Uh, this uh, work involved a lot of other researchers. Uh, so for meltdown, there were um, Werner Haas and Thomas Prescher from Cybers Technology, uh, Daniel Groß, uh, Moritz Lipp, Stefan Mangard, Michael Schwarz, uh, Anders Vogt was credited by the other researchers for uh, early uh, contributions of ideas, uh, and uh, Mike Hamburg from Rambus was also, also involved. Uh, okay, so basic outline, I'm first going to present uh, shared concepts for the attack variants, um, then I'm going to give an overview over the three variants and then explain, uh, uh, give a little overview of how each of the variants works. Okay, so uh, uh, basic recap. Um, there are covert channels in uh, modern CPUs, uh, and in particular, I'm going to look at the cache-based covert channel, uh, which is that basically um, the pattern of memory accesses you perform affects the state of the data cache, and then subsequent uh, data, um, subsequent memory accesses have timing that depends uh, on the data cache state. So this means that um, by measuring the timings of memory accesses, you can get information about the memory uh, addresses that were accessed uh, previously. So there are a bunch of attacks you can do with that, uh, and here I'm just going to be talking about flush and reload because that's the simplest one. Uh, normally this is used as a side channel to attack things like cryptographic implementations and leak keys and stuff, uh, but um, here it makes more sense to conceptualize it as a covert channel. Um, I should note that there are other covert channels, so if you want to mitigate these issues, uh, just mitigating the cache-based covert channel probably won't cut it. Uh, okay, so, uh, uh, okay, the colors are working pretty well. Okay, um, so um, basically, uh, what are like speculative execution, out of order execution, uh, branch prediction, pipelining, what does that mean? Uh, so basically, the idea is that the processor can execute instructions in parallel and even in a different order than they are in the machine code. Uh, and that the processor can also predict uh, branches before the target of a branch is known. So in this code example, you can uh, in the first line see two accesses to a foo array. Um, and if you look at the machine code, it looks as if the, C uh, the CPU would first load the value, uh, if the first value um, foo array at index one, and then load the value of foo array at index two. But memory accesses can have some quite some high latency, and so the processor can perform these two memory accesses uh, in parallel, more or less, um, so that the total execution time of this first line uh, goes down. Um, then next, uh, we can see that there's a branch where, depending on the result of the expression of the first line, we're going to either execute line two or line four. Um, and again, uh, this, there could be high latencies both in line one and line two. Um, and so the processor can predict that we're going to uh, be executing line two even before the condition in line one has been evaluated. Uh, and then the processor can go ahead and even do the third memory access in par parallel together with the first two memory accesses, just to make things uh, even quicker. Um, okay. So, of course, this can go wrong because we can predict that we're going to take uh, to uh, execute the one line and actually we're going to have to execute the other one. Um, so uh, that's misspeculation. Um, this can be caused uh, not just by uh, incorrect prediction of branches, but also um, by exceptions that occur in the middle of uh, a series of, of instructions. So for example, if one instruction causes a page fault and you've already started uh, executing uh, the subsequent instructions, you're going to have to discard the changes made by those instructions. So um, this is implemented by preserving the old register states um, while executing instructions speculatively, so you can roll back the state of registers and memory writes are buffered inside the processor core and not written back to memory until the CPU is sure that they should actually be executed so that you don't have to go back to the memory and undo me changes to memory or stuff like that. But importantly, uh, changes to the data cache are not restored because the data cache is not something that you really see architecturally when you write a normal program, uh, and actually keeping stuff in the cache uh, helps make things run faster. Um, so ch cache modifications are not restored, and this means that you get a covert channel um, out of misspeculation. So um, if, you have, uh, if you have either a branch that's mispredicted or instruction that uh, actually um, falls, and the CPU uh, continues uh, executing down here on the left side uh, to the predicted target, then you have these um, transient instructions that run here that um, will be rolled back later, but from inside these transient instructions, you can send on a cache-based covert channel. 
And then when the CPU has rolled back um, your transient instructions and starts executing uh, with uh, architectural control flow, um, the stuff that's actually supposed to happen according to the documentation, then you can start uh, doing uh, timing, uh, timings there and using those to read from the cache-based cover channel. So this means you get a cover channel out of um, uh, these transient instructions uh, and can leak data to which you have access in these transient instructions. Okay, so a quick overview of the three variants. The naming is a bit confusing uh, because uh, uh, there are multiple peop people supplying names. Uh, so uh, we have uh, the first two variants that are named uh, Spectre and the third variant that is named Meltdown. Um, the first variant uh, can more or less be characterized as, a, as bypassing bounce checks uh, and primarily affects things like interpreters and JITs, although that's not necessarily um, all you can do with it. Uh, the second variant uh, is an injection of branch targets and primarily affects things like kernels and hypervisors, but again, theoretically, also uh, other things. And Meltdown uh, just affects uh, operating system kernels and software that architecturally behaves like an operating system kernel. Okay, so uh, let's start uh, looking at uh, the first variant. Um, so here we have a conditional branch um, where we have this, this uh, attacker-controlled X that is highlighted in red. Um, that uh, is compared to an array size, and only if the X is below the array size, we actually do an access. So if you look at this uh, architecturally, it all looks fine. Um, we, uh, if uh, X is too big, we just don't execute the second line. But if you look at this with the knowledge uh, of, what, of the speculation that processes do and this branch prediction, then you can see that if an attacker um, first trains the branch prediction to assume that X will be smaller than, the, than this array size, and then an attacker uh, makes sure that the cache line that contains uh, the size of the array uh, is evicted to main memory so that when the processor tries to evaluate the condition of the first line, it has to go back to main memory and wait for the memory access to, uh, to finish and so on before it can actually resolve the branch in the first line. Then at an attacker can use that to cause the second line to be executed as transient instructions. Um, and then you can see that here, um, the, uh, in these transient instructions, you will have an out-of-bounds memory access uh, into the first array. Um, so you, you read memory that is out-of-bounds and belongs to something completely else uh, in your process. Then you multiply that with 256 and use it as an uh, index into a second array from what you read. So this means that uh, every um, distinct value that could be at this out-of-bounds position, out-of-bounds from array one, uh, maps to a different cache line uh, that is used for the access to array two, which means that later you can leak exactly what the value was by measuring which cache line in array two uh, becomes uh, fast. Okay, so um, uh, in practice, uh, where is this relevant? So uh, one uh, interesting example are JavaScript sandboxes. So JavaScript code um, runs in a sandbox um, that tries to enforce memory safety, so you're not permitted to just read arbitrary pointer dereference uh, you're not permitted to read arbitrary memory, not permitted to uh, uh, dereference pointers, uh, and you can't just access arrays out of bounds and so on. Uh, but the browser runs a JavaScript from untrusted websites, so we can try to use JavaScript to create a construct um, like the one uh, we saw on the last slide. Uh, Java, the JavaScript engine will have to uh, either interpret code or compile it, uh, and will insert uh, bounce checks uh, and things like that to ensure that there's, uh, there are type safety, memory safety, so on. Um, but um, with the speculative execution, we can potentially bypass these safety checks and access memory that actually should not be accessible to us. Um, so here's a code example of how that looks in JavaScript. Um, you can see that it more or less looks like the code we saw previously, so uh, you again have this uh, pattern of uh, uh, a comparison, then an, a first array access mapping uh, to, uh, and then mapping to a position in a second array, but there are some differences. Um, so again, uh, we, have this, uh, we have this index that will be in bounds to train the branch prediction and then out of bounds to actually read out of bounds memory. Um, we again have uh, an array length uh, to which we are comparing. Um, where we want the length to not be in the processor cache when we're actually doing the attack so that um, the processor transiently executes uh, lines two, three, and four before the condition line one has been resolved. Um, one, in one thing to note here is that, of course, the JavaScript JIT engine will itself um, make sure that we are not accessing things out of bounds, but we don't want the 
want the code that the JIT engine is going to generate if it thinks it has to generate this check for us. So um, we do the check ourselves. Um, we uh, do the actual um, uh, memory uh, out of bounds read. Um, both in line two and in line three, you can see these uh, all zeros. They're just tricks to make the JavaScript uh, uh, optimizer uh, generate more optimal code so that the attack works better. Um, here you can see that um, we are uh, ending the value that we uh, read um, with, uh, with a constant. This uh, serves to um, show to the JIT engine that there's a maximum bound on this value and the JIT engine does not have to insert its own uh, bounds checks that uh, might uh, make things slower for us. Um, again, we have this multiplication to map the value to um, uh, a lot of different uh, cache lines depending on what the value is. Uh, and uh, we access uh, the, the table into which uh, we're going to leak the data. Um, and last, uh, because this is a JavaScript engine and JavaScript engines love to optimize, optimize things away, uh, we're going to have to uh, provide some output um, where the JIT engine can prove that it won't be used. So that's what the local jump, junk variable is for. Uh, okay, so um, variant two. Um, the basic idea here is we have branch prediction in the processor, and this branch prediction can both predict the conditional jumps uh, that we've uh, seen before, but it can also predict uh, indirect calls, so uh, calls to instructions where the target instruction pointer is coming from, for example, from a location memory or so. Uh, and this uh, branch prediction uh, uses a table called the branch target buffer, and at least on an Intel Haswell, Intel Haswell processor, it seems to be indexed and tagged by a partial virtual address and a fingerprint of recent branch history. Uh, now, the thing about branch prediction is, uh, as we've seen, it's expected to sometimes be wrong, and this means that uh, unlike in the case uh, of, for example, a data cache that always has to return correct information, uh, a branch predictor can be designed, the branch target buffer can be designed so that it can sometimes return invalid data. You just shouldn't do it too often because then you hurt performance. So um, the branch target buffer uh, is therefore not always uniquely tagged, and uh, for example, many branch target buffer implementations, like uh, in the Intel Haswell processor, do not tag by security domain, like for example, whether you're on the kernel or in user space, or whether you're inside or outside a VM. Um, so there was prior research that used this uh, to break address space layout randomization across security domains. So um, you can, for example, have two processes using and running in user space, and then the victim process uh, just runs some code that has branches in it, and then the attacker code does timing uh, of some branches and can use that to infer things about the state of the branch target buffer, which reveals where the code is located in the victim context. Um, uh, then you can also do that from inside a uh, virtualization guest to figure out where the hypervisor is located in host memory. Uh, and the new thing here is that you can also do this the other way around. So instead of using the branch target buffer to leak data from the victim to the attacker, you can use it to inject branches from the attacker to the victim. Um, so you can, uh, if you can uh, insert uh, entries into the branch target buffer, you can cause the target context to start executing transient instructions at, a, in some implementations, completely controlled address. Um, uh, yeah, so um, there is, uh, I wrote a POC for this against uh, the KVM hypervisor. So this is just a very rough overview. Um, but basically the idea is first you start by breaking the hypervisor ASLR using, uh, branch, uh, using the branch uh, target buffer leak uh, of address information uh, as shown in pre uh, prior research. Then you try to misdirect the first indirect branch that occurs uh, after a guest exit, so when you, switch uh, when you switch from the guest back into a hypervisor context, um, and you flash the, ca the cache line that contains uh, the memory operand uh, to the indirect call, such that the indirect call takes uh, a couple of hundred cycles to resolve, during which you can get a transient execution at an arbitrary address. Um, now, one thing that uh, helps with the attack here is that the state of the virtualization guest, um, the register state of the virtualization guest, uh, is, becomes the register state of the hypervisor when you switch from the guest to the hypervisor. Mm, all the general purpose registers stay the same. Then, of course, the hypervisor is going to start using these registers itself, uh, which will clobber most of them. But uh, at least in some kernel builds, you can see that at the time of the first indirect call, you still have control over like four registers, um, which you can use to um, get more control over what uh, the uh, code you're misdirecting execution to in the hypervisor will actually end up doing. 
Uh, also, guest memory is mapped in the hypervisor. Um, so while the um, while the hypervisor and the guest don't share their virtual address space, the hypervisor has a separate mapping uh, of all the pages that you have in the guest. So this means that if you can figure out where this mapping in the hypervisor is, you can uh, place uh, guest controlled data in memory in the hypervisor and then reference this memory uh, from the instructions that you're transiently executing uh, to get even more, more control over the execution of the hypervisor. And uh, one uh, particular uh, thing you can do with that uh, in the case of KVM is that there's this uh, eBPF bytecode interpreter in the hypervisor, which basically allows you to uh, which basically has this function that you see at the bottom of the screen uh, called BPF proc run. And as its second argument, uh, it takes an array of uh, instructions in some bytecode format, and it will then run those instructions. So uh, with this uh, code gadget that you see above that, um, you can first uh, get control of the second argument register RSI. Um, using the register R9, which you already control, and then you can use your control over uh, the register R8 and uh, over memory uh, to provide the destination of the uh, call. Um, so then that lets you run um, arbitrary bytecode in the hypervisor uh, in, during transient execution. Then you can use the bytecode to read a memory and leak the data into the cache and then leak the data out of the cache in the guest. Uh, okay, so uh, now a meltdown of variant three. Um, so here on the right-hand side, you can see uh, a depiction of the virtual memory layout, roughly, uh, of uh, a user space process. Um, and you can see that the address space, the virtual address space uh, of the user space and the kernel space is shared, um, uh, at least on, for example, x86. So um, while the user space does not actually have uh, permissions to access uh, the kernel mappings, um, the kernel mappings are present in the same page tables that user space is using, and there's a bit in the page table that says whether you're uh, supposed to be able to access some memory from user space or just from kernel space. Um, and now we're just going to use this more or less the same pattern that we were already using for variant one, um, where we um, start by dereferen dereferencing some pointer. But importantly, in this case, the pointer points, uh, as you can see on the right side, uh, into kernel space, specifically in this mapping of all physical memory that kernels tend to have. Um, and we uh, just try to do this read. Ob obviously, this uh, instruction will not be able to architecturally execute completely because, um, well, this is a kernel memory and we can't just uh, architecturally access kernel memory. But it turns out that in, uh, on at least some processors, um, you can continue execution um, uh, in transient instructions after such, an, such a reference to kernel memory and the value that the read is returning is accessible from the following transient instructions. So again, we, we take this value, um, we uh, map it uh, to, uh, to values that are sparser so that uh, each different value maps to a different cache line, use it to access uh, some, uh, uh, th this array two um, to leak the data into the cache. Then execution of this will be terminated because we accessed uh, a kernel memory, but uh, at this point uh, it's too late and uh, we can use architectural attack code to leak the data back out of the cache uh, of this array too and uh, figure out what the value was. Um, so it's not entirely clear yet what's going on uh, in the variant three uh, attack. So there seems to be some race condition involved in a privilege check in the processor. And there's a pretty straightforward result uh, that you can leak uh, some cache data uh, from the kernel. Uh, so in particular from the L1 data cache or so. Um, but the TU guards uh, people have also figured out that you can read uncached data. It's just not entirely clear yet what influences how well that attack works precisely. Um, one last thing uh, you saw in this slide that we were doing uh, this um, dereference of a kernel uh, address, and I said that this is not going to architecturally execute. The processor will raise a page fault because we are accessing an address we're not supposed to be able to access. So there are three ways you can deal with that, um, because normally the kernel will just then terminate your pro program when you get the page fault. Um, but you can use a signal handler, so you can just tell the operating system, hey, when I get a page fault, I would like to continue execution. Obviously, that's a very uh, noisy approach, uh, but it works. Uh, the second way is to use the TSX instructions that you have on some processors, where you can, before you do the uh, actual access to a kernel pointer, you can tell the processor that if something bad happens, it should just roll back the execution state and do something different for you. Uh, or the last option is to put a mispredicted branch in front uh, of the faulting instruction so that even the faulting instruction itself is just running as a transient instruction uh, and not actually being executed architecturally. 
Okay, so uh, basically, in conclusion, uh, there are covert channels in CPUs, and they're useful for more than just transferring secrets between trust domains that are supposed to be isolated from each other. Uh, and um, while most security issues are correctness issues, not all security issues are correctness issues. Uh, okay, here are some references, um, first to the various uh, research papers and blog posts about this issue, and then some prior research that I mentioned in this talk. Uh, yeah, and I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Okay. So we actually have uh, plenty of time for questions, so I would invite people to come and, come and take the mic if uh, there's something you'd like to ask. And if you're planning on speaking in the, uh, my goodness, the line is forming over here for the, uh, the lightning talk session. Okay, uh, let, me, let, me, let me lead off the questioning by asking, asking Jan a little bit about the, um, as much as you can say about the disclosure process that was followed here and how the different groups were interacting with each other throughout this, this process. I think that's an interesting part of the story which you haven't really touched on in your presentation. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so um, we, um, Project Zero reported this issue to um, uh, Intel, AMD, and ARM uh, in, uh, at the start of uh, June uh, uh, last year. Um, and I, haven't, I didn't hear from the other researchers until, uh, uh, some, t uh, until some, sometime later in the year when uh, Intel contacted me and said that they'd been contacted by other security researchers. Okay, so you're, you're playing that one with a straight bat, I think it's, uh, in, 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 but that's fine. Um, there's questions from the mic, Matt Watson. Uh, so I would just like to ask, are there, you didn't really talk about cache coherency, where if we have a multiprocessor system, are these transient instructions going to generate changes in the cache of other processors as well? Uh, you mean, so, you mean whether they're going to have effects where, for example, a cache line that was exclusive uh, becomes a shared cache line? Uh, I would think so, but I'm not sure whether I've actually tested that. Okay. Uh, this is a, a pretty significant attack and uh, quite hard to mitigate. I was wondering if you think that this is the kind of thing that um, as vendors develop patches and uh, patches get rolled out, it's just the kind of thing that gets simply uh, solved, or do you think it's pretty much the end of civilization as we know it? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think, and but so variant one is pretty, uh, seems to be pretty easy to mitigate. It looks, uh, so from what I can see from the process of vendors, it looks like uh, the, the Kaiser uh, patches uh, that are now called KPDI that uh, Daniel Goss uh, and uh, other researchers developed uh, are going to solve that pretty well. Uh, the other variants, I'm not so sure about. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I have a less technical question. What was you and your colleagues' reaction when you first stumbled across the <laughs> Spectre and Meltdown? Uh, good question. Uh, that was like half a year ago, so I'm not entirely sure anymore. Uh, I think it was, it was a relatively gradual thing, uh, so uh, it wasn't as if uh, we had suddenly stumbled uh, uh, over the whole thing at once. So you only with time you saw what it means. <laughs> hmm? Only with time it became clear what it means. Yeah. Okay, and how has your life been affected by the leak, by the media leaks in the recent week? Like, has it changed? <laughs> uh, I don't really want to comment on that. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, speaking of media leaks, uh, it, it's very unclear in some of the media, you know, articles that have been written, uh, exactly which processes are, are vulnerable to which variants of the attack. So, like, as far as I can tell, everything works on Intel. Um, uh, but what about like the ARM? Do do all three variants work on ARMs as well and stuff so, like that? So ARM actually published uh, some uh, pretty uh, ARM uh, published a website where there's a, a table that clearly says that um, specific processes, which specific processes are ver vulnerable to which specific variant. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, what does this mean for trusted execution environments such as uh, Intel's SGX? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I've been wondering about that, but I didn't really look into it. So uh, uh, okay, I, I yeah, can I comment on that. Yeah, there's like something going around on Twitter, but I have no idea. <coughs> Cheers. Do you have any thoughts on how these flaws existed for, I presume, a couple of years, and then all of a sudden two or three different research groups sort of 
all stumbled across them within some short time interval? Seems sort of interesting, like. So it, it seems to me that um, the topic of uh, cache attacks uh, has been coming up in the last years uh, quite frequently. So this, this thing that there are, there are cache side channels that you can use to perform such attacks, so for me personally, is something that uh, I've been become more aware of in the last couple of years, I think. Um, and uh, without that, I probably wouldn't have stumbled over it. I'm not sure whether that's true for the other researchers. I think Paul Kocher in particular probably uh, has a lot of experience with that prior. <laughs> you alluded to there be, this being one of a class of side channel attacks. Um, do you have any further pointers to what uh, areas of research are likely to be fruitful there? So I haven't really looked into that much, but there are some papers where you can see, for example, things on uh, where not just the cache timing, but also the timing of, uh, of DRAM accesses uh, uh, differs uh, based on previous uh, memory accesses. And you could also uh, try to, uh, I, I think Paul Kocher pointed out that you could try to time uh, the uh, length of the transient execution instead of uh, trying to afterwards trying to leak things uh, from the cache. And there's also some research, uh, I think, from Sophie D'Antoine about uh, uh, leaking between hyperthreads uh, information about which execution units are being used by the other hyperthreads, because hyperthreads uh, share the execution units. Uh, and so uh, th there's some scheduling going on, and so that means that you can uh, leak um, through the behavior of how the CPU schedules things out of order, um, what the other threat is doing on a relatively coarse level. Okay. Um, I think there's no more questions. And One it's more a, up here. A great point at which we should end. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, questions upstairs where? Okay, go ahead. Hi, surprise. <laughs> so, um, paradigmatic attacks like this tend to generate hasty fixes that are broken you know, pretty quickly thereafter when the next paper season comes around. Um, what do you think, uh, especially for something like this, vendors can do to make sure that their fixes um, address more generally the underlying problem rather than, you know, sort of paper over the existing attacks? Well, I mean, that's, that's on the process of vendors. Uh, it's, it's, they are the only ones who are really in the position to be able to completely review what the computer is doing, and uh, so uh, I don't think... Uh, that's something I could, for example, particularly help with. Thank you. Okay, I think that's a great place to stop. So let's thank uh, the speaker again. Thank you very much. Mm.